Hello, I'm Richard Bryant, Executive Director of Musco Center for the Arts at Chapman University. Welcome back to the At The Musco online series where you can connect with real people in real time. Faculty, students, professional artists, and one another, all engaged in what we call the art of community. Tonight, we launch Voices of Our Time, a new online series that celebrates Chapman University's more than half century singing tradition and brings to you firsthand stories and experiences by some of today's top singing artists and companies. Bill Hall, Dean and founding artistic director of Musco Center, has uh, got a great deal to do with that singing tradition over all these years. And so we honor him tonight. The Musco Center behind me was built as a world-class performing arts venue with acoustics by the internationally revered Yasuhisu Toyota. The LA Times called it an ideal opera house, potentially the best in the West, and maybe something more. What better way to launch the Voices of Our Time series than to feature the LA Opera? Over the past four years, Musco Center has partnered with LA Opera to present multiple operas in concert bringing them to Orange County, such as Don Carlo, Nabucco, and Robert Devereaux. And they feature the LA Opera Orchestra, Chorus, and Principals. This evening, we invite you to take a peek behind the scenes with some of my favorite people in the business and to look at the challenges and advantages of taking opera from the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion down the freeways to Musco Center for the Arts. And now, here is your host, Musco Center's Napoleon Gladney. Thank you, Richard. Good evening and welcome to Voices of Our Time in partnership with LA Opera. If this is your first time joining us for an At The Musco Online event, welcome. Please take a moment to like, follow, and subscribe to Musco Center's channels on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. You can also join our mailing list for updates on new happenings and online events just like this one at muscocenter.org. We have received some brilliant questions from our viewers that we will be including in tonight's conversation. Please take those opera related questions and ask them in the chat and we will try to get them answered at the end of the conversation live on air tonight. LA Opera has been an artistic affiliate with Musco Center since our opening and we are elated to have members of the opera engage in an in-depth conversation with all of us tonight. To get us in the mood, let's take a look back at one of our most recent LA Opera productions that were also performed at Musco Center, Roberto Devereaux.
For those of you just joining us, welcome to Voices of Our Time with LA Opera in Conversation. We are so honored to be joined by our moderator, Rupert Hemmings, the Vice President of Artistic Planning with LA Opera. Rupert will be joined by five other members of LA Opera shortly. I'll be returning to ask your questions to the cohort a bit later. And with that, I pass off the mic to Rupert and LA Opera. Thanks, Napoleon. It's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, I know I speak for all of us at LA Opera when I say that we're very happy to spend an hour with the Musco Center for the Arts at Chapman University. Um, we've been down and presented four different um, performances in concert over the last few years. We'll get into a little bit more detail about um, what those were and how they came about during the course of the call. Um, our relationship with, with the Musco Center is incredibly strong. It's such a pleasure to go down and perform in, in a hall that has such um, acoustical excellence and uniqueness. Um, and you're gonna hear a little bit from um, all the members of the panel about what it means to them. We thought it would be nice to um, bring together different people from different parts of the company. So we've got, you'll, you'll meet all of them and uh, they'll tell you what, what it's like from their perspective. Um, when we bring a show down to Musco, we, it's one that we're already performing at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in Los Angeles. So the advantage of that is that by the time we get down to perform in concert version on the Musco stage, we've already put in weeks of, of rehearsal um, with all the different elements um, of the company. And so we consider ourselves to be in, in fine and, and, and well-prepared shape by the time we get down to your hall. And then being able to perform um, without the staging and scenery and costumes allows for a whole different dynamic of performance, which is what you're going to hear about. So um, before we get to that, we thought we'd flash back to another of our um, performances back uh, in 2018-19 in season. We brought Don Carlo down to the hall. So um, I believe we're going to hear a little excerpt and see a little excerpt from that. So there we had some Don Carla, which was from our production in our 2018-19 season. So um, our relationship of, of traveling down to um, Chapman dates back to 2017, 
when we brought a performance uh, of Nosferatu with Matthew Coyne uh, down there. Um, we've since done three <coughs> other um, presentations. In 2017 and 18, we brought Nabucco, as I said, in 1819, uh, Don Carlo. And then um, the clip you saw at the beginning was Roberto Devereux. That was the 1920 presentation. And we were very lucky to get that in before we all um, disappeared inside due to um, the current pandemic. So that was a, a recent presentation. And as they've all been in the past, a really a pleasure to, to, to put on. Um, we will have more presentations in the future. We're excited about our future relationship with the theater. Uh, and I'm quite sure that um, we will be there on a yearly basis. Um, and, and we look forward to that. So um, as I said, we, what we thought we'd like to do is go around and you'll meet all of the folks you see on screen. And uh, they'll tell you a little bit about who they are and what their role is for LA Opera, what the challenges are that come with, with, with taking a show uh, into a different theater in the middle of a run, and probably a couple of other things they'll tell you too. And at the end, uh, I'm sure we will do our best to answer any questions that anybody might have. So uh, with that, I hand over to our production director, Michelle Magaldi. Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle McGaldy. I'm the production director for LA Opera. I've been with the company 13 years, and I've been fortunate to be involved with all the shows we brought to Moscow Center. Uh, my, my job involves coordinating logistics, which includes everything from getting the buses scheduled to working with the great staff at the museum to the technical operation of the performance. So internally, I'm leading a team, which includes stage managers and other production staff who uh, guide the performances, the performers through our day of rehearsals and the performance. So it's it's a long day, and they're um, they're the folks that make sure you know we everyone gets to where they need to be and has what they need to do their best job to prepare for the performance. So um, my role starts with long term planning when we think about what show we're going to do. We set up the schedule and a budget and decide how we'll go about bringing a show to the to the Moscow Center. And I know we'll talk more about how that show, those shows get selected a little bit later in the panel. Um, so once we're at that point, it's all about coordinating all of those details that kind of bring our company down to Chapman. That's everything from um, you know, directions for people who are driving to buses to, you know, is there equipment that we need to bring on a on a van or a truck and sharing all that uh, information in advance with the staff at the, at the theater. And on the day of the show, I'm working with our team to make sure artists, you know, like we like I said, get, get to the theater. They know where they're going. They're going to a new space. So um, all of that planning and, and guiding them into, into the building so that they can be ready for the show. Um, we don't bring a lot of our technical elements to the theater, but we do bring super titles, sound cues, occasionally some props, so we'll take time in the theater to have a little bit of a rehearsal, make sure everyone knows um, where, they're, where they're supposed to be, either in the orchestra or uh, our singers would, you know, need to be in the right spot on stage. And then we'll run through things like our super title cues. In Devereaux, we had a canon sound effect that we had to check to make sure, you know, the level was appropriate for the space. We do all that on the day of. And then, you know, at that point, ideally the show runs and we, we just get to enjoy the performance in the hall, which is really um, a great experience to hear, hear the music in, in that fantastic hall. So that's kind of an overview of my role and my uh, experience in bringing our shows to MUSCO. Thanks, Michelle. Um, as, as a piece of context, when, when we travel down, depending on which production we're taking, uh, somewhere between 130 and 200 people are, are traveling from um, our home base in Los Angeles. Um, and that makes up the chorus, the orchestra, principal singers, of course, and, and, and the music staff and, and some technicians. So it's, it is a, quite an undertaking. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce um, our Richard Sieber music director, James Conlon. Hi, James. Hi there, everybody. I'm very honored to be with you all and pleasure with my colleagues here the panel and to be able to at least appear before you uh, at the at the Moscow Center. And I'm also happy to uh, having been privileged by the Chapman University with an honorary doctorate of which I'm very proud. It makes me feel right at home to be able to, to 
to address all of you. Uh, so what do I do? Uh, well, I'm the guy that's up there waving his arms around, sometimes to no avail, sometimes to a little bit. Uh, so, but what is a music director? The music director's job goes well beyond just conducting performances, rehearsing. Uh, it also has an artistic leadership role, the, uh, which consists of long-term planning, which means a choice of repertory, choice of singers, uh, lots and lots of collaboration uh, with, uh, with the colleagues throughout, uh, throughout the company. But of course, very, very centered on my role as a conductor and as a, uh, a director and hopefully an inspiration to the orchestra, to the chorus, to the music staff, uh, to all of the guest singers. Uh, and that's my job to unify all of them. Now, what happens when we go on the road to Moscow? Uh, it's a special moment because almost all of our performances are, of course, theatrical. And they take place in a theater, which means that the orchestra is in the pit, everybody's on stage with costumes, and uh, you get, of course, a complete artistic uh, entity, which we call opera. So, what's such a good idea or what isn't a good idea about concert opera. Uh, I think it's a very, very special moment, not just for the audience, but also for the company. Why special? I think that a, uh, a concert performance of an opera gives the audience an opportunity to hear the music with new and different ears. Automatically, because the orchestra is on the stage, they hear things that the audience doesn't usually hear, or you hear them in a different in a different context. Um, for singing, for the singers, it's a different experience. Uh, there is theatricality, of course, but you are closer. Everybody is close to you. The orchestra is close to the singers. The singers are uh, the chorus is close to the orchestra, and the acoustical challenge of having to get off buses and go right into that with a very short rehearsal is something that's very salutary for us all. And why is that? Because we have to adjust to the acoustics immediately. In other words, you can't fall back on habits. You've got to use uh, all of your senses uh, to, uh, to be there in the moment. And I, I think that that stimulation for every individual who's on that stage is very special. And that's one of the reasons I personally look forward to when we come to Moscow. Thanks, James. Um, speaking to, of one point you made there, so when we when we do arrive down at Moscow Center, we have um, one 30 minute rehearsal for the whole company um, for a piece which usually is going to run somewhere between three and four hours. So um, that is a pretty frenetic half hour in order to try to um, get things lined up in order to start on time and have it sound good. Um, we're lucky to have um, a principal artist from Nabucco and Don Carlo and many other shows on our uh, Dorothy Chandler stage, but specifically those two um, at Chapman, uh, Morris Robinson. Hi, Morris. Hello, how are you? Good. So tell us a little bit about uh, how it works for you when you go down there and, and, and what it's like. Well, it's kind of like, you know, on this most simplistic format. It's like going to a, on a field trip, you know. Uh, we're all used to being in the opera house and working with all the all the wonderful things that we have there, costumes, et cetera. But when we get to go out and do the show at the Musco, it's a different feeling altogether. First of all, we travel on buses together, so we get a chance to spend time together before the show. As a principal, you know, I like to spend time by myself and focus. I can be really in a good mood or really in a bad mood, depending on how things are going that day. But we interact with one another and have conversations and laugh all the way there, and looking forward to you know bringing a beautiful mu musical experience together. So we get to know our, our colleagues a little bit better, and then you know we have a very short rehearsal time, which you said is kind of frenetic. It's really it's tough because you have very some key, th key things that you have to hit in a very short amount of time, and then you know we put it together and go with it. Now we've been prepared musically for this, but the audio experience for us is different because the orchestra is actually on stage with us this time. So the, the amount of delay that usually happens when we're singing above the orchestra, now they're right behind us. And sometimes the conductor's behind us. So we have to do, you know, cheat our, our voices this way or that way so that we can see him and also be accurate with the music. So 
those are some of the challenging things that makes it fun. I think that uh, one thing that I do like about it is when you don't have to worry about taking this prop to this person and go over here and talk to this guy and do this and turn this way and go upstage and run up the stairs, you don't have to do that in Musco. You get to just stand and sing. And that's one of the most beautiful things because then you really get a chance to concentrate on all the musical expression and the colors and the timbres of your voices and the, and the you know, you, you don't have the other things to work with. So you spend more time emoting through the music as opposed to doing it through the characterization. So I think it really helps. But sometimes I feel that the performances there are much better musically because we're able to concentrate just on that aspect of the thing. So I, I really enjoy my experiences there. Yeah, that's. I mean, uh, I think everybody feels that just standing and singing and concentrating just on that in that beautiful hall, it really does give a, a dimension that is hard to come by in in, in a ha other houses. Um, so we are lucky to have a, a mezzo soprano from our um, chorus, Alida Braxton. Alida, a very long time member of our chorus. Alida, I'm I, I'm not gonna. Um, guess how long it's been, but it's many years and we're so lucky to have you. So um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about um, this experience of, go of going to Chapman from your perspective and from that perspective of your colleagues in the chorus. Oh yeah, thank you. Well, I did start as a zygote in the chorus. So. <laughs> yes, and as Morris was saying, we have a wonderful opportunity of camaraderie, um, not just musically, but also you know personal relationships that we get to share with each other because we're all in the chorus, but also with the orchestra. And um, very lucky that so many of our orchestra colleagues have already been friends, but you know, riding on the bus together, going on a little short tour, we were actually sitting with them and having conversations. Um, musically on stage, it is a bit of a challenge for the chorus in that part of our job is to react to some things going on. And we're on stage and we're actually listening to this beautiful, the beautiful solos that we don't always get to hear because we're often in the dressing room uh, changing or changing wigs or costumes we're waiting to go on so we're on stage um and have to actually sit a little more quietly than normal <laughs> because now we and we want to react and, and uh, show emotion for some of the things that are going on and we we don't so uh part of the fun and i do say fun is being able to chill and enjoy our solo uh colleagues so we uh, hear those duets and solos and small ensembles. Um, but it's, I, I do kind of miss being in costume and staging sometimes because it's fun to get into character when we uh, uh, do the shows on, in our live performances. But uh, I'm also very grateful that we are on stage with the orchestra because we also get to, um, we get to enjoy hearing them play more closely and I, I, find, I find myself sometimes just getting lost and listening to some of the passages that the orchestra plays on their own. Uh, and we are very, very blessed, as I said, and very grateful that we have what I call LA Opera as a uh, well-oiled machine. So we have Michelle and we have our wig and makeup department that come down with us as well. And everything runs like clockwork, everything. Every, they've timed everything for us. We know when to be, where to be. Um, we have people that care about us, how we're doing not just did we get on stage, but that we're okay. So I find that they take the time to know what needs to be done for all of us. Um, not just, you know, getting down on a bus, but that we're okay musically. We're okay, um, we're with whatever we need to get down there. Um, and we're grateful for the buses because rush hour traffic is really bad. <laughs> it's really bad. So thank you so much for all of that. And uh, yes, I enjoy working with all of you. It's, it's a great experience. And the theater is, like I said, the acoustics are great. My colleagues have often commented as well how we just love this. Even look around how beautiful it is. And the sound and the acoustics is just awesome. So I'm grateful to be there. And thank you for inviting us. And I'm looking forward to more. Can can you just tell us just a, very briefly a little bit about um, your history at LA Opera, just as such a long-standing <laughs> member of the company? I'm sure people would like to hear about that. Oh, thank you. Well, I I I just reached 150 productions with LA. Well, actually, I'm now 156, I think, and I'm the first woman with LA Opera to reach 150 productions. And we think the first African American of any opera company to reach 150 productions with any company. But yeah, I've been there since the first Otello, so that was a <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, 
I, like I said, the productions we do are so much, it's just, it's an amazing experience. I grew up in LA and I remember going to the music center as a kid thinking, wow, it'd be so awesome to be a singer there. And now I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thanks for that. Um, so uh, we're lucky to have um, a, the first, a first violin from our orchestra, Grace. Oh, Grace, hi, it's nice to see you. Hi. You tell us so, a little bit about traveling down to Chapman from your perspective. Well, usually I forego the bus and drive myself. Just I'm Los Angeles native, love my alone time in the car. And so I generally drive down myself, um, usually make a day of it, go earlier so I miss the worst of the traffic. Um, because I really like walking around the campus of Chapman. And also whenever I'm going to a new concert hall, it's just, I love walking around just to see what the hall is like. Also getting my bearings um, backstage, where, where's the stage entrance? Where are the dressing rooms? Where are the restrooms? Just, just getting a lay of the land. Um, and it's just, there's something special about being in a concert hall that's empty without the audience there and just getting a feel for the acoustics, the beauty of the hall and just also figuring out, well, where am I gonna be sitting? Because we're coming from a pit where usually space is limited. Um, and as a violinist sitting on the ends, we're usually very aware of a wall that bows tend to hit one way or the other. So now we get to be on stage, which is wonderful. We also have to remember, well, now we're not hidden in a pit um, and to be aware that we are being seen. Um, but it's just, it's a wonderful experience because we get to hear closer all the singers. Like when we're in the pit, there's kind of disembodied voices that are way above us. And sometimes depending on where they are in, on stage, no matter what we do, we still have difficulty hearing them, even though that's what we're trying to do. So it's wonderful to like be able to hear the artistry that they're providing. And it, in a way it's like, that's what we're supporting. That's what the orchestra there is to support. Um, and it's just, it's a great experience to be able to bring that and really concentrate on the music making. Um, I've been a violinist in the orchestra now. Um, I first started playing in the orchestra in 2003 and officially became a member of the first violin section in 2017. Um, so it's it, it's really been quite the experience. And having grown up in LA, I remember seeing Salome um, at the Dorothy Chandler when I was in college and we got to perform it a few years ago. And I felt like I had come full circle um, mm. in my career. Great, thank you. Um, as we were preparing for, for this call, we, we had a little discussion amongst ourselves and, and came up with some, some subjects that we thought we'd talk a bit uh, in a sort of circle, circular way. So um, the first thing we discussed was how do we decide uh, which, which piece to bring down uh, for performance there? Um, and I think um, one of the there's several key things here, one of them is at what time of year do, do Chapman want us to come and, and present? So clearly that's going to play a large role in what we have um, available to, to, to present. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a big part of it. A second part of it would be that um, in as much as there's plenty of fantastic um, contemporary opera and we would never rule out doing contemporary opera, we really want to do the grand opera classical experience, which is what we've done for the most part in the past. And we also want as many of our family uh, of company members to be able to come as possible. So we don't want to bring a small piece with, with a very small orchestra and no chorus at all. We want to showcase the company and have as many people participate as possible uh, in, this, in this event, which is, 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 is so much fun. J James, do you have perspective to do with, with your thoughts about the rep that we perform there? Well, I think, as you have just said, uh, a lot of it, first of all, we have to bring something that we're doing. And we tend, and I think by, we, we agree, of course, with the center who decides also what they would like us, what they would like to hear. And so that plays a big role. And um, for me, it's mostly been large, very operas. And of course, I love that. And, and uh, I think that also has enormous appeal uh, to, the, to the audience as well. And so, that has been the line we've taken, but that doesn't rule out anything. I mean, there are the sky's the limit, and uh, as long and as when we are able to continue again, and when when that moment comes, 
I think it's an open book, and I look, you know, I look forward to that, uh, that, that the expansion of that repertory as well. Yeah, I mean, we, we've also discussed in the past that, that the possibility of, of bringing down stage productions, which is clearly a, a larger endeavor, but something we'd love to do in the future is to actually um, present uh, a, a small run of, of, of full, full scale productions. Um, so that's uh, Richard Brown and I have discussed that and, and it's something we'd, we'd love to do in the future. Um, so something that everybody's touched on in their introductions, but we'll go back to, and if you feel that you don't have anything to add, that's fine. But the next thing we discussed was, uh, is it difficult to adapt? Morris, you really talked about that quite a bit. Um, but um, uh, actually you all did, I suppose. Um, Michelle, I think probably this falls to you mostly because there couldn't be a more whole scale adaption than a full opera production to a, a concert. I mean, in some ways, the easy part is cutting of the things that we do on stage. We don't have wigs, we don't have costumes, we don't have scenery, we rarely have any props. Um, you know, we do, as Alita said, bring some of those folks backstage with us to make sure everyone has what they need in terms of hair and makeup and, and things like that, dressers to press things and make sure everyone looks their best. But, um, you know, we we are fully adapting, as you're, as you're saying, to a new environment, orchestra on stage instead of in the pit, singers down at the edge of the stage in front, uh, solo artists, and then the, the chorus towards the back on riser. So the, the big question is how to fit everybody on stage. It's hundreds of people, and it's always something that um, the crew of the theater, you know, we're working on a drawing for, for a couple of weeks to say, how, how are we gonna fit everybody in the shell? So that's a huge consideration that we, we get into. And then, um, you know, sometimes we have backstage music. Well, there'll be a singer uh, or even a, an instrumental ensemble that's written off stage. So we'll figure out how does that work? Do we, does Meister want us to continue to have that off stage or would he like it on stage? And, and if it is backstage where, and we have that 30 minute rehearsal to, to listen to that in addition to everything else that we're trying to do. Um, we do bring sound cues down to Musco, so we do that. Uh, and titles, that's our other big technical element, is to make sure that we bring our super titles so that everybody can understand what's happening uh, in, in the opera. But um, yeah, it's a lot to figure out with, with not a lot of time. So it's every, all hands on deck to, to make that happen. Um, time is, is so often a, a challenge for us when we rehearse a piece. So. Maestro, I'd, I'd ask you, when we were talking earlier about the 30 minute rehearsal for the three and a half minute piece, how do you approach that rehearsal? How do you think through the best use of that time? I think you meant three and a half hours. Um, I'm sorry, three and a half minutes did I say? Yes, no, let's go with hours. Yeah. So uh, concentration, decision in advance, what you must do, what's an absolute necessity, uh, what you can trust to happen by itself, and to just take the things that have the greatest potential uh, because of the new situation of going wrong. Sometimes it's no more than just let everybody play and sing for 10, 15 minutes until they understand where they are because after all, they are going to be adjusting themselves. So just to give them an idea. And you, you know, any conductor who's done a lot of touring and of course in my life, especially with symphony orchestras, I've done a lot of touring uh, the challenge is just there. Walk on a stage, figure it out, uh, sometimes with no rehearsal, figure it out and uh, play with the acoustic because every acoustic is different and every acoustic gives you something different and you have to react to it because that's your universe for that moment. Um, so that, that's, I mean, the, the touring element um, is something that I think all of us have talked about a little bit. Um, maybe Morris, you could speak to this a bit. We talked about it when we were preparing. Um, the idea that even though we've only gone um, a few score miles, it, 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 it's a feeling of company that, that is very different to performing in our own house. What, what, would you have much to say to that? Well, yeah, I think that, you know, it's, it's quite natural. You know, we rehearse in the opera space and then we rehearse in the, uh, in the actual theater for weeks and weeks and weeks. And we have a set. And we've been rehearsing on that set. So we have all these things that we're familiar with with this, with this production. Sometimes musical cues are gotten from being in a certain spot on the stage. I know I'm here, this is happening. I know I'm here, this is happening. 
uh, you know, I'm here, this is where the high E comes, you know, so, you know, you're, you're preparing yourself and you're pacing yourself when you're just standing there. Sometimes you start thinking about the text and think, oh my God, what's next? Because you're not interacting with one another. So it's a, it's a different environment, but I think it adds to the excitement of the performance, you know, uh, anticipating that this is going to go well and, and that adrenaline going, it, it, I, I always feel, I feel like it's a, it, it is a concert, but I feel like I get a chance to really give it all I can vocally and I don't have to pace myself because of the running around and stuff on stage. So it's, it's a wonderful experience. It's definitely outside your house. And I think that that's fun. You know, when, when, when you're at home and you're performing, you know, you're with your family and your friends, you, you're one way. When you go out in public, you know, you try to be a different way. So I feel like you give more there because the energy is different. You know, it's just like, there's a whole new crowd of people and, you know, we're bringing it to you and we want to give it to you and leave it there. So uh, I, have a, I have a wonderful experience with that. And I think it's a wonderful element to what we do as far as presenting uh, our beautiful art form. So, yeah. Thanks. thanks. Um, Grace, tell me, um, for the orchestra members, uh, do you guys discuss it being a, a different feeling when you're in that house? I mean, it's definitely, if it's spoken or unspoken, we want to put our best foot forward since it isn't, we aren't home. We are visiting in a new hall. Um, and there is a little bit of extra attention to what's going on after having come from the pit and performed it, you, you kind of feel like you know what's going to happen on stage or where certain things tend to need a little bit of space for staging or whatnot. But there on stage, you're, as the orchestra is definitely aware of, this is a different acoustic. Um, balances are going to be very different. And it's really depending on the maestro to kind of show us when, oh, we can actually play out more here. Oh, we really need to play less here. Um, and just trusting him to kind of be the guy through the entire performance. But it's definitely, I think everyone is more alert. I feel like just because it's such a new set um, of circumstances and even just what you're hearing where I'm, wherever I'm sitting on the stage, it's gonna be very different from what I'm used to hearing in the pit. Um, and also as a violinist, sometimes we're also very aware of the fact that the singers, principal singers do need to come walk by us. So there is a little element of beware, don't poke the singers. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just being aware of during that soundtrack, that's part of the time when we figure out what is our physical space, how far, how close are they gonna come and if they're coming a little too close, maybe just tapping them on the shoulder and just saying, we don't want to poke you, but it's a little close. It's not the poking, it's the, I don't want to hit that expensive violin, so. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just small things like that, and even just sight lines, because in the pit, we're all on risers, so those of us who are shorter in stature, me, is always able to see the conductor, but once we're on stage and flat, it, it, all of a sudden sight lines are very different. And so it's important in that 30 minutes that we figure that out as quickly as possible. There's a lot of negotiating with the, within sections of like, okay, can you go this way? Can you go that way? And just figuring out so that come time for the performance, all we're worrying about is playing the piece. Alida, I know when we were preparing for this, you had a few things to say about um, the camaraderie that you guys feel uh, in the travel down there. And the, we, the, 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 the theater is kind enough to provide us with a full meal when we go down to have um, once we go off the transportation and before we go to the sound check. So do you want to add to that from the oh, choral? Sure, sure. Uh, well, I also want to add what, what, um, what Morris was saying as far as part of our music memorization is where, do we, where are we on stage? At this part of the stage, I'm singing this, and that part of the stage, I'm singing that. But yes, on to the meal, which is quite good all the time. And another part of camaraderie with the orchestra, we often sit with them and just, just literally have a little community feeling. Um, I'll give you a little kind of funny story about we have at the Musco difference from uh, Dorothy Chandler. Uh, our dressing rooms are downstairs underneath the stage, so we're used to going up. At the Musco, we go down, and there's been times when we get there, we might, some of us have gone upstairs. There's no stage, so we have to remember that. Thank goodness, Michelle and staff and the crew have put signs. Awesome so we, sign. Yeah, thank you for the signs, 
So that's kind of fun. And the orchestra's done the same thing. We've all, and which elevator do you take or not take to go <laughs> where you're supposed to go? But again, that's something we all share, all those funny little uh, quirky experiences um, being at a different hall, which is maybe happened. Um, I think I've been there every single time. <laughs> And I still forget that I've got to go down to the stage, not up to the stage. Um, J James or Michelle, do you have anything to add about the, the, the different environment and the camaraderie and how it feels in company? Well, uh, shall I go first, Michelle? Because I have less than you do. Because the conductor is always sort of, you know, slightly, slightly isolated. Now, as Grace does, I drive down. So I do not, I've not yet experienced a bus. But I hear a great deal about the bus, especially about the trip home. But I do hear that everybody has a great time and the, and the sense and the feeling of, of, a, of the unity of the company is always strengthened by these, these experiences. Um, now, I've got a lot to concentrate on. So, I mean, I co come in there, I have to concentrate on that half hour, most of all. And then, uh, you know, I always, uh, Morris mentioned, uh, my moods have nothing to do with it, Morris, but I always concentrate before the performance. And it's actually a little bit easier at Moscow because I don't give a pre-performance talk. I give a pre-performance talk at every performance in Los Angeles for 45 minutes. So figure an hour before the performance, 45 minutes of uh, talking in the foyer uh, in the uh, Eva Stern, Mark Stern uh, hall. And then I go to my dressing room, run around the dressing rooms. Michelle's seen me do this, run around. Morris, I visited you often. Alita, I, sometimes I see you on the way through um, and say good luck to everybody. I like to pass by every singer's dressing room before I do that. And then it's down to the pit. Sometimes I've never tripped over Grace, uh, but I've always checked to make sure she's there because I always feel better and good when I know you're there. So um, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not a part of the social life thing so much, but I feel very connected with, every, with everybody just uh, despite the fact that the conductor is supposed to be sometimes, you know, distant, I don't go for that. For me, it's a we are all uh, we're all human beings. We're all artists. Uh, we all have our functions, and uh, that's to be shared on the same level. Michelle, I don't know what you think about all that. Well, part of what you're saying, I think, is that in the opera house, we all have our own track, and we're all used to doing things in a certain way, and we come in at different times, and even during rehearsals, we certain groups are heard separately from other groups and it's only kind of on specific days that we come together and even then we're, we're on our own schedules and and something I think is that's nice about doing this concert is we're all we're all guests in in a new space and we're all kind of on the same track so we get to encounter each other in, in ways that we normally don't because our we're not on our usual routine so I think there's a different blending of um, the groups of performers and, and staff, and uh, it kind of fosters a feeling of, you know, we're all together in a, in a working in, in one, as one unit instead of a collection of many units, you know, different gears in the machine. So that's something that I, I enjoy about it. Great. Um, well, I think that I hope that from hearing from all of us, uh, it's clear how much we enjoy uh, doing this engagement each season. Um, and as I said at the beginning of, of, of the call, we really look forward to a continued partnership well into the future um, with as many more presentations um, at the hall. So uh, with that, I think we are going to hand it back to Napoleon, who has some questions from uh, uh, attendee members. Napoleon. Hello everyone, so happy to be joining you all this evening. I have some great questions from the audience that I've been looking forward to asking, so let's begin. All right, so there are some questions around teaching and coaching. Uh, first question is from Morris. Can you tell us about your past masterclass experience with Chapman University students? Yeah, I saw that question pop up, so I'm like doing double duty here. I'm like looking at this because I try to be a millennial as best I can. I'm not quite there yet. I don't think I can go backwards in time, but no, it was a wonderful experience. What I do recall, and I think it was a few years ago, they have some wonderful voices there. And I've sung with some of the alumni from there. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I, 
I've sung with a few of them actually, but they they have some wonderful voices. The teachers are great. They have great staff there, and uh, I enjoyed every minute of it. I can't remember specifically uh, the few people I heard, but I think one of the young ladies I heard actually made it to the LA Opera Young Artist Program, and I think someone else made it to the Met Finals the following year. So they have a wonderful program. Uh, I applaud them in their efforts. You know, being so close in proximity to Los Angeles, I'm sure allows those kids to come and see us and, uh, you know, see how the pros do it. And I think it's also a wonderful thing when we can go out there and show them. Because I think, in fact, we had the master class just before our performance. Uh, so I was telling the kids, you know, a lot of the things I'm telling you now, you'll get to see demonstrated on stage. And I was talking about the different voices, which I was in the cast with. So I think it was a wonderful education process that I could talk to them, give them my firsthand advice, and then they can actually see it uh, applied live, right, you know, three days later. So I think it was wonderful. And I think they had some great kids and I'm looking forward to if I get a chance to come back out there. So, yeah. Wonderful. We have a question uh, to all of you. We can decide who wants to answer this. Uh, what is the most valuable lesson you have learned as being part of LA Opera? Um, well, Alida, being that you're, you have such long standing, why don't you give us a start of that one? Um, be prepared for everything that they ask you to do. Um, seriously, it's, I found my background, or every, all of us have many backgrounds in languages, to be prepared for that, because we've had to sing in you know, Russian, French, German, Italian, Spanish, uh, some dance. Um, they, Sanskrit. Like, yeah, Sanskrit, yeah, Sanskrit, oh my gosh, I'm gonna forget that. So we have, so I would say be, always be prepared and be flexible. Uh, be a team player. Always, you know, sometimes, you know, there's every now and then you might not get along with everybody, but you have to be a team player. And that means not just with your colleagues on stage, but a team player with your wig and makeup people, your costumers, your dressers, uh, the orchestra. It's a team. You're all going for the same goal. You're all going to, you know, you all want to uh, go for those hundred points. Everybody working together. And like I've said, it's a well-oiled machine. I, I'll never forget the timing. They even practiced timing when we did Macbeth. We had rehearsals for timing because the women had four costumes or five costume changes and four of them were on stage. And the wig and makeup people, the dressers were on it every single time. And they were nice people. It was, it, it was one of the most enriching experiences and also um, the lesson of being prepared and being where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. I can butt in there, you know, just to say, you touched on something very important. I think that uh, I, I've been music director now for 15 years. Uh, and I've said it many times, I think this is one of the nicest opera companies I have ever known. I've been in a lot of opera houses and uh, great ones, but not so great ones, uh, not good at all. But the atmosphere in Los Angeles is very, very special because it's a team spirit because people are friendly and they do their work. In fact, I believe personally, my credo, that people work better when they feel comfortable with their environment. I don't, I don't like uh, authoritarian regimes and I don't like having to use authoritarian methods and so I don't. The nice thing about LA is that that all functions and it's, uh, I believe it's a great quality. And I think that's one of the qualities that's uh, also going to get us uh, through and to thrive at the end of this very difficult period that we're going through. Yeah, the, I would just pick up on, on one thing that you both said, which is that really um, there are no individuals in, in our opera company Everything. Oh, I'm breaking up, so why don't we just go to the next question then? All right, next question. Several of you mentioned the sound in New Spo Center's Hall. How would you describe that sound and the acoustics for those of us that have not been in the hall for a long time or have never been? Well, acoustics, <laughs> acoustics are about hearing. If you can hear what's going on and it has a, a mellifluous sound, it's a good acoustic. Our acoustics go anywhere from very live to very dead on a spectrum. Uh, Moscow is a live acoustic and one that I think, now Grace, you can tell us, 
how does it, uh, I think from the orchestra's point of view, it enhances the sound. That's my commission. I don't know if you agree, Graves. Definitely helps. Um, you don't feel like you have to force your sound out into the hall because <laughs> it, it is live and it doesn't take much to get just that feedback. And so in a way it's like, it, it does take some adjustment to that because we're coming from a very dry pit and to come up into that, it's it, it, it's not that we have to work harder. In, in some ways, you, you don't have to work as hard to produce the beautiful sound because the fall helps enhance the sound of the orchestra. You know, from my vantage point, um, I said before, when you're on stage and you're singing over the orchestra, that's one sound. And when you're in front of the orchestra and they're behind you, it's a different sound. Uh, I can't remember if it's liver than the Dorothy Chandler or not, I think it may be. But I do recall um, it being much easier to sing because the orchestra's behind me, so I can just let it all go. And I felt like I was getting more back. So it's a beautiful hall to sing, in, in my opinion. You know. Napoleon, why don't you hit us up with another one? Yeah, I think it's actually time for our final question. Um, it's kind of a big one. And I think maybe it'll be great to have everyone answer. We'll see. Um, what do you see as the future of opera in a digital landscape and post-pandemic? Uh, um, here at LA Opera, we, we started immediately um, that we all got locked down with a, a new program called LA Opera at Home. And it's a, a very interesting platform where we do events such as the one we're in right now. Um, and we have concerts and, and uh, we stream recordings of, of previous performances and all, all sorts of different, um, very diverse programming. Um, what's interesting about that is that we feel as if we've tapped into an audience that maybe existed pre-pandemic and it isn't just an audience that's a result of the pandemic. So this is something that we will continue to look at exploiting um, once we are back to our, our, our usual practices. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting, LA Opera has um, multiple forms. We have our main stage presentations. We have a program called Off Grand where we take multiple different kind of works out into the community around the Southland. And we have a, um, a program called Connects, which also takes works out into the community. And my instinct is that our LAO at home brand that was born out of the pandemic will become another arm of the company, which is fantastic. Um, and for the future of, of the art form, we have great confidence in it. We love presenting um, opera and everybody on the screen who's with me uh, is in this business because they want to be in it and they're in it for life and and that's where we're going to stay i think so james you want to you want to take a crack at it yeah, well i think that the uh the necessity of screening and finding solutions about how to get how to perform and how to connect with our audience and in fact how to connect with all audiences is now going to be so much a part of our lives for uh long enough i mean we're going to be talking months we, might talk, we don't know how long yet, but it's going to be long enough for us to start to get a handle on how to do it, how to do it well, to how to develop the infrastructure so that you can stream, maybe commission new works that are specially made for the period of COVID, where you can't have uh, a large audience or any audience at all, uh, where singers have to be at a certain distance from each other on the stage, where the orchestra can't be so numerous that they can't be, uh, be at a, a good uh, distance also. So I think, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of adventure, uh, of invention, and that all of us, all of us uh, have to find creative solutions. And I mean, I myself am finding creative, very creative to, um, to make a podcast every week. Uh, and I, I, you know, I've, I've done 13 of them already, and it's, it's me. It's very intellectually challenging how to do that. Uh, the biggest challenge is learning how to deal with the technology, but that's because I'm over 39, and that is hard for people of my generation. But uh, we're all doing something. I don't know, Michelle. What are you? What do you think? Michelle. Uh, yeah, I think that the um, it's interesting to me that some of the digital stuff I'm seeing in the pan, in this you know time during the pandemic, it op actually offers an opportunity to have more intimacy and a different kind of personal experience with performers 
that you know as we're opening um, our Facebook channel to see someone doing a recital live from their living room, it's a much different experience than seeing a, an opera on stage or even a, a concert on stage. So that to me is really interesting. And then um, I hope that all the things we learn, you know, about producing digital stuff comes back into our live performance and that, you know, we don't spend a bunch of our time and energy learning about TV production to then not bring that back into work on stage. So I think we'll see a lot of that incorporated into the stage shows once we're on the, on the other side. Morris, what do you think? <clears throat> I don't think anything is going to ever replace live performance, obviously, but I think it can be an addendum and an addition to it. I uh, I think that a lot of the things we've done, and I was in the, I think the second, maybe the first LA Opera at Home series concert, and the way it was filmed and the way it came across, I think was done really well, audibly and visually. So I'm with Michelle that we can use some of this technology and incorporate it into what we do, but I see it more so being an advantageous aspect of the marketing of our art form, reaching out to lots of people in a very immediate way uh, with, you know, showing the personality and the person, you know, what we do and who we are. I think it, it's going to be utilized more so in that regard. Um, you know, I'm a big guy with a big voice and I'm a bass. There's not a speaker made that's going to sound like me in the house. So I pray that we get back to the theater because you know, I enjoy doing what I do. I think it's a calling. I love doing what I do. I love doing it with LA Opera. And I want to get back to doing what we do. Uh, there's no substitute. You know, my Bose speakers, no matter what I'm listening to, it's not going to sound like a live performance. But I do appreciate that we're being innovative in this regard. And I hope that we can find a way, like Michelle said, to take this technology and incorporate it in what we do to enhance what we do and make it more marketable to a wider audience. So. Great. Grace, you want to you wanna go? First of all, I just miss making music with my colleagues and everybody on stage and in the pit because there really is nothing playing by myself. I, I, I've done that enough. I don't want to do it anymore um, in my lifetime. I trained and came into this career to make music with other people, um, be it in an orchestra or in an opera company. And that's the energy you feed off of from those around you is really what makes the live performance experience. And we can try to convey that digitally. And I'm glad we're keeping our art form out there this way during this time. But I can't wait to get back into the opera house so that we can share everything with everyone and have the energy of the audience there. Um, yeah, it's, I can't wait to get back. Alita, I think the last words with you. Oh, I was going to agree everything. We're in a new age. It's a learning curve for all of us. Um, I know virtual courses are not ideal, but I'd rather be doing that than nothing. And we've been managing to do that. I know Mashbow's done some. We just did a upcoming um, op great opera choruses, so that will be coming up. <laughs> Plug. <laughs> anyway, um, my high school did a version of West Side Story where they actually, the kids were told where to look, and they imposed some green screen uh, scenery. So it's, the technology is, we're learning as we go with all of this. So yeah, I look forward to performing with you all live in person soon. Wonderful. That is our time for the day. Grace, Alita, Michelle, Morris, James, and Rupert, thank you so much for being with, here with us tonight. Thank you. Yes. That's Rupert, true. can you tell us uh, where we can learn more about LA Opera at home? Um, if you just go to the LA Opera website, laopera.org, um, it's very clear there. And um, there are links to past events and there's information about upcoming events on that. So that's... Perfect. We definitely all will be tuning in. Thank you all again so much for your time tonight. It was really, really special. Thank you Bye. for having us. Yes. The Musco Center Creative Fund makes at the Musco Online programs like this one possible, while also helping to fund the presentation of world-class artists, ensembles, and speakers on our stage. Please consider donating at muscocenter.org. On behalf of LA Opera, Musco Center for the Arts, and Chapman University, thank you for joining us at the Musco. We hope to see you soon. Have a great night, and thank you for joining us with the voices of our time. Good night. <laughs>